Uh, thank you all for your uh, patience and for joining us on this miraculously gorgeous night. I, 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 we couldn't have picked better. Uh, my name is Suzanne Clary. I'm the president of the J. Heritage Center, and I'm so grateful to see so many people interested in American garden design. And uh, the book that we are going to hear about tonight has been written by one of the preeminent American landscape historians. Um, she, I, I, am, I feel lucky to call her a friend, uh, more, more, as well as a colleague. <laughs> Mac and I have known each other for now, like over a dozen years, um, in 2010. And for those of you who know a little bit about the history of this place, Mac was actually uh, instrumental in helping to save it as a, a board member of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. In 2010, long before this book was even on your radar, right? You were even thinking about this book, or or the other book I'm going to mention as as well. Uh, we we met, and the Cultural Landscape uh, Foundation uh, identified this property as a threatened landscape. People were dumping here. There were invasive species. No one knew what an invasive species was, but we did. That we we did, and the imprimatur of an early uh, you know, woman landscape architect named Mary Rutherford Jay had been completely erased. And one of the things that we discussed and learned as we got to know each other was that we were both really interesting interested in restoring narratives of the landscape. And the ones that were missing were the ones that belonged to women and people of color. So, so we bonded on that note. And Mac was here for a number of occasions um, with the Cultural Landscape Foundation, the uh, Bridging the Cultural Divide um, back in 2010. Um, a, a other, other occasions uh, with Thomas Waltz, who became our landscape architect for the gardens. And so it's, it's really a, a, a dream for me to welcome her here to talk about her newest book. Now, I would be remiss if I don't mention the book that she did before this, uh, which was about the, uh, the uh, Sylvester Manor Plantation in Staten Island, I, I mean, sorry, in uh, Shelter Island, um, which, have any of you been out there to Shelter Island, to Sylvester Manor? It, yeah, it's really an extraordinary place, and, uh, and Mac made sure that she told the story of th over three generations of prejudice and uh, invisibility of the people that live there. And again, this place that we're trying to restore, we're trying to restore all the narratives, not just the narratives of the Jay family. And so again, we, we, we have that commonality. Um, but tonight she is going to talk about her newest book about Bunny Mellon and talk about somebody who had their pulse on, uh, you know, uh, th their finger on the pulse of American culture. Although, although I have to say, I, I th think, Mac, you have your pulse, <laughs> your finger on the pulse of, of, of American culture also. Yeah, not as much as she did. Um, but we're going to hear about the life of Bunny Mellon, who is most famously known for designing the Rose Garden at the White House for the Kennedys, and then later, very sadly, the uh, memorial at Arlington Cemetery for, for JFK. And uh, Mac knew Bunny Mellon personally. She has gone through her archives, and uh, you are going to be hearing things tonight that you wouldn't necessarily know or hear about from anyone else because, because they were so, so close. And uh, we will do our usual format, which is about a 40, 45 minute talk, followed by 15 minutes or longer of Q&A, Q&A from your seats or Q&A over a, a, <laughs> a daiquiri. I, Bunny's favorite drink was a lime daiquiri. And so in her honor, in Bunny's honor, we are having lime daiquiris tonight. Um, so I would like to introduce my good friend, my colleague, landscape historian, uh, author, Mac Griswold. This is such a pleasure to be standing here under the flowering chestnut tree with my friend, whom I've known since 2010, and we were equally strangled by having decided that we could take on two decaying 18th or early 19th century houses, and we would be able to bring them back to life, as Suzanne said, not just for the people who built them or owned them or enslaved the people who lived there, but also for the very difficult to find 
disenfranchised of the Jay House and also of Sylvester Manor. And of course, it's always easier to find the history of the Jays or the Sylvesters, but it's not so easy to find the history of the people who lived and worked there because at first they're always, people say, nothing is known of their history. This is a very familiar line. So congratulations to Suzanne and her staff and all of you who support her in doing this to have it be a place that's inclusive for everyone. Give her a big hand. All right, this is the story of a woman who, how many of you know about Bunny Mellon in some way or another? Please raise your hands. Oh, okay, fair number, all right. Well, what's usually said is that she was very rich. <laughs> Indeed, she was. She also is known to have been very extravagant. Indeed, she was. But is extravagance a sin? I'd like to ask you. It's Sunday. We can talk about sinning or we can talk about not sinning. Anyway, it's the story of a woman who lived very well by any standards. And here she is in her very much publicized Givenchy hat, which was designed for the garden and that she wore as a, a client of Givenchy's from 1956 until her death in 2014. In this picture, which I love, she's off to work in her own garden at Oak Spring in Virginia in 1986. And she was a robust 76 years old at that time. I'd met her in 1956. To me, she was just a parent. She was the parent of my good friend at school, Eliza Lloyd. And so Bunny Mellon was just a, you know, she was somebody's mother. That's all. But I chose the Gershwin song, so you'll hear more about how the friendship evolved, but more about how Bunny evolved as the superior landscape designer that she was. But I chose the Gershwin song as the title because Bunny was at her happiest when she was designing anything. It could be a garden, it could be a shed, it could be a collection of books, it could be a grand party, anything as evanescent as a party was just fine to design. I'll build a stairway to paradise because it was a way for her to reach paradise along with the people that she was taking there. The Rose Garden, which Suzanne mentioned, which she laid out for President JFK in 1961, is what she's most famous for. But how did she, how did just this rich woman uh, from Pennsylvania and Virginia, as she later came to call herself, they do say that anybody can call themselves a Virginian if they just think of themselves as a Virginian. Virginians are very inclusive. So, in 1961, she found her way to the White House. So what skills, this is what we're going to talk about today, is what skills and contacts had she acquired that allowed her to take on this very important job? Do you all recognize this picture that shows the, uh, the tulip parterre, which was a wonderful Four Seasons garden? Bunny designed it with what she knew from the landscape architect of the same period, as Mary Rutherford Jay, that would be Ellen Shipman. So she read all of Ellen Shipman's works, and then she was imbued with the idea that you could design a garden that had formal structure, but didn't necessarily have formal plantings. All right, August 1961, Cape Cod, one of the Mellon homes. That's when the plan was hatched. And the young president is listening very carefully. If you ask me, he's look, he looks like a schoolboy. Look at Bunny. She's telling him with those beautiful, long, molding hands. She's saying, here's the idea, and here's what it should look like. And he's saying, uh-huh. And, and they're having steamers and champagne, a good lunch. Now, some 
in this audience might have had their own ponies. I know of one person here who, in fact, did. Tell me, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. And maybe even had them up on uh, porches where they didn't really belong, like this pony. But this is the Oval Office. The year is 1962. The Rose Garden was finished. As you read Stairway, you understand that the difficulty in reading this book lies in accepting this singularity of class and structure and money. You have to accept it and just move on through the story to understand what this woman did besides spend money and buy things. Because that's quite a common thread these days about her. Uh, anybody who might have read Merrill Gordon's book knows how much money she spent and who she was friends with and who she wasn't. But they don't know very much about the person who designed the Rose Garden, who was great, great friends with Jackie Kennedy. This is the Mellon's Villa, King's Leap in Antigua, which was a private respite for Jackie Kennedy only months after the assassination in January 1964. Eliza, that's my friend, and Bunny, and a pineapple. The pineapple figures prominently in this photograph, I feel. And they are sitting together at breakfast. It's important to remember that beneath their perfect society manners and oddly similar whispering voices, everybody's familiar with Jackie Kennedy's whispering voice. Bunny's was very much the same. It, it, was, a useful, it was a useful intonation, is all I can say, from what I know of both women because through it ran an electric current of power. They could move, manipulate, and cut with finality. Billy Baldwin, Baldwin, the great decorator, how many of you know about Billy Baldwin? Oh, wow, okay. Billy Baldwin once said that his friend Bunny had, quote, no tolerance for the mediocre. In 1968, Five years after JFK's assassination, are we there? No, we're, uh, come on, move on, move on. There we go. Just an incredible photograph for me. Bunny flew a shaken Jackie down and back in the Mellon Plain to Martin Luther King's funeral, April 9th, 1968. And Bunny walked very watchfully by her side Bunny was at Jackie's side for many of the crises of her life from the moment that they met in 1957 in Virginia until Jackie's death. They were the closest of friends. Oh. After Kennedy's death, Bunny, as Suzanne had point, has pointed out, Bunny worked with the not entirely willing Warnicke family in creating the JFK gravesite at Arlington Cemetery. There she is in her standard black dress, straw hat, and little bitty heels. Are they called kitten heels? Those? Okay. And she's ever so pleasantly overseeing the removal at a staggering cost, $7,700,000, of tons and tons of gleaming white Vermont marble, which was what the Warnicke firm wanted to have the gravesite be made of. But they were going to be, all those miles, were going to be replaced with Vinyl Haven, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, granite. Bunny's idea was that pinkish New England granite suited JFK's character better. And so it came to pass. She was very good at getting her own way, and we'll hear more about that later. Bunny herself and I watched her do this, was no mean hand with a grater. She could just hop on. She had a great eye. You know, some people have perfect pitch. Other people know exactly how a grade should be. She did. So she graded this hill. It's a hillside beneath Arlington House, a view that was very important to, to uh, Jackie Kennedy. It was a view that JFK had liked, had felt symbolized a union of North and South in some interesting way. So Bunny softened the curves and sharpened the grade above the eternal flame 
and above the soft pink granite. Now let's backtrack. How did we get here? Let's backtrack to a grim, solitary, and stubborn 10-year-old born in New York City in 1910 who moved to Princeton at the age of 9 or 10, I forget. She never shed that solitary quality, nor her stubbornness. She used both, and I, I speak of them as valuable qualities, because often for women, it's more difficult to be solitary or stubborn and hold to what you believe, think, and want, as some of you here must know. So she used both her grimness and her stubbornness and her solitude to resolve her own internal struggles and to exercise her own great creative talents and, it must be said, as weapons. She grew up in a house like this that her father built in Princeton. You know what Chekhov said once? This is completely interpretive. Here we go. Anytime, Chekhov said, anytime the writer at the beginning of a story mentions an axe. You know that axe is going to turn up somewhere later in the story. So I'm previewing the fact that I'm not going to tell you about who Bunny axed or what she axed. I'm just going to tell you, you have to read the book. <laughs> so she grew up in a house very similar to this house. I keep looking for the screen, you know, but you're looking at the screen. Um, that her father built in Princeton. And then after Foxcroft School, she moved into Carter Hall, which is the grand 1793 uh, Virginia house that her father purchased, purchased in 1929. Very clever man, her father. He sold out in July of 1929. Any of you know who know the crash history, know that that was a good time of 1929 to sell out. So he did. He's kept ever since. So Bunny's mother continued living in Princeton at Alburn Mall, the big house that uh, Gerard B. Lambert had built, because she and Lambert were divorcing. So at Carter Hall, young Bunny, age 19, was the boss in the house and in the garden. And so began her, the exercise of her native abilities to become a, a, a style figure. She met the gorgeous Stacy B. Lloyd, Jr. of Philadelphia in 1928, and she married him in 1932. And here they are after their son's christening in 1937 on a cold spring day, hence uh, the coat that's called, uh, what is that overcoat called? It's called, uh, not a balaclava, that's a hat. Bal McCann. Bal McCann is a Scottish tweed. Um, in her Bal McCann on a cold spring day in the back garden at Carter Hall, where they lived for five years until they built their own house in the very stripped down style that became Bunny Mellon's trademark. In 1942, Stacy enlisted in the Morale Operations Branch of the OSS, the new Office of Strategic Services. All I will say about the OSS is that they were phenomenally successful in World War II, but the list of those who joined the OSS reads like a, reads like a compilation of, uh, of the American Social Register, um, De Bratz Peerage, uh, the Almanac de Gotha, and the New York Post's page six. <laughs> so he sailed for, for, for Europe in 1942, leaving Bunny at home in Virginia with her son, young Stacy, five years old, and Bunny, eight months pregnant, with their daughter, Eliza. That's Apple Hill, the creek bottomland. That photograph, the terrier, my terrier, my Irish terrier, is there, of course, purely for uh, scale. <laughs> she would never intrude unless you were asked, right? Sure, Irish terriers, we all know them. So Stacy and Bunny had bought 10 acres of land adjoining Carter Hall in 1937, and they built a house. Apple Hill, very different, you have to say, if you look at that house on the hill from Carter Hall, 
that commanding bunch of columns also set on a hillside. Carter Hall had been Bunny's second enormous, drafty, echoing, columned residence, and she wanted out. So she hired a Paoli, Pennsylvania architect, Charles N. Reed, to build a comfortable farmhouse instead. The site also bears hallmarks of her own landscape style. It's tucked behind a hill, which you can't see here, but believe me, it's pushed back against the hill so the wind doesn't reach it. It falls down a hill, which you can see plain. It has stables at the right, that first little triangle, and then it has a greenhouse down the hill. So everything usually falls down the hill in a sequence in any bunny melon landscape, and it's a handy trick to have to make your house and garden or anyone's house and garden fit into the curves of a piece of land. There's also a spring. See the bridge in the distance? A little tiny bridge over a, well, you can't, you, you, it's next to the wood. And the, also to have a wood was a very important thing for Bunny to have. And once she found a pattern, she really stuck to it. Remember that Givenchy hat? that I showed you. She carried the givon she had throughout her life. It was just handier to have a pattern. And every place that she designed and built for friends or for herself was something that had many of the elements of this same patterning. She kept immaculate garden notes. Uh, this is, these are dated, I can't read them now. Can you read them? 1935, 36? Yeah, okay. And although she was a truly terrible speller, she learned how to spell names like Schizanthus, um, not the easiest at any time. Run your eye down below Schizanthus and you'll see Clarkia. Clarkia, Clarkia is pink. Clarkia was sewn on, in, on October 28th. It germinated in 10 days. It finally flowered in April. And then here's Bunny making a decision executively right away, she writes, not worth the trouble. When Stacy and Paul Mellon, their neighbor in Virginia, returned from war, he was in the OSS as well, both marriages were threadbare and nothing seemed the same to them because life now included death on the battlefield but war had also rocked women. Bunny had found the solitary space and time to consider her life. What had she done? What had she been so far? Was it enough for her ambitions? Paul's first wife, let's wait for a minute. Hello, LaGuardia. Paul's first wife, Mary, died in 1946 of a heart attack that was brought on by asthma, her recurrent asthma. By May 1948, Bunny and Paul Mellon were married in New York City, and they were happy in the wide scope of their new life. Paul, unlike many husbands who don't recognize of that period, who don't or didn't recognize the, their, the prowess of someone's skills early on in the marriage, Paul did. He said to me one time, many years later, he said, Bunny was so lucky, she knew what she wanted to be from the very beginning. And he was so proud of her for that. There were lots of other things that were wrong with their marriage, but he did give her in 1956 for Christmas this absolutely magical sura Conte crayon of a woman holding a bunch of flowers, which is an image of fulfillment to me. They had moved into Oak Spring at last, and the gardens were taking shape. The Impressionists that they had collected in the 50s now form the core of their eventual gift to the National Gallery of Art of more than 500 such Impressionist and Post-Impressionist post paintings. Four years later, Paul began an affair with Dorcas Hardin. 
whose daughter was also a classmate of mine, that would last until Paul's death in 1999. At the moment that, that Paul announced this, so according to Bunny, stories are going to be different all the time, you know, one or the other. She said, Paul, do you want a divorce? Briskly. Paul answered, no, you will take care of the children and be Mrs. Paul Mellon. Okay, that sounds limiting, doesn't it? I mean, when... <laughs> so not for Bunny. It meant gigantic opportunities, not only for acquisition, but also for learning for a woman whose education finished at the age of 19. 19. Last bit of formal education she had. She never stopped learning. I would watch her sometimes and she'd meet somebody and she would always be the questioner. She'd always be the person who was asking, how do you do this? How do you do that? She, do you know, does, who knows about the firm of Colfax and Fowler in London? Anybody? Okay. Um, she, what's the name of the guy? John. Who? Yeah, John Fowler. She told me that she closeted herself with John Fowler for an entire day to learn how to make a silk tassel herself because she always believed in learning to do things yourself. It's part of that solitude. It's part of that stubbornness. Um, it's part of that need to know no matter how much money you have, you should be able to do things from the ground up. So Paul answered, no, you will take care of the children and be Mrs. Paul Mellon. Paul and Bunny became partners. They were no longer lovers. And it's a kind of marriage that's hard to understand in today's quickie divorce world. It was uncomfortable. A lot of the time it was compromised. Uh, and yet somehow it remained a marriage. They had learned that staying together, staying apart, kept them together. A mile-long private runway doesn't hurt. 30 years later, Paul retired from his long tenure as the National Gallery of Art Chairman. Bunny had, or, had begun to build her own legacy as well, the Garden Library, one of the greatest botanical and garden libraries in the world. You can go there by appointment. She wore her most splendid jewel, the flowery necklace that you see encircling her net, neck as she talks to Carter Brown in this photograph at Paul's retirement party that was created by her friend and lover, the jeweler, Jean Schlumberger. By that time, she had also designed five or six houses, sometimes I lose count, um, and many gardens for her family and scores for friends as well. The doggies and I miss you at this hour, 7.30. Hurry on home. Now, if ever there was a man who was the Ogden Nash of, of uh, the, who was the millionaire, uh, the Ogden Nash millionaire of witticisms, it would be this man, Paul Mellon. Imagine, he's quite sick. He's waiting for her to come home for dinner. He, she's always late. She's never on time. And so he simply signs, gives her an idea of how he's feeling by saying, status quo, I'm here, I'm holding on. Although Paul always kept in touch with Dorcas, by the last decade of the, his marriage to Bunny, the two had really come to more than an accommodation in their complex relationship. They loved and understood one another. So now she was truly Mrs. Paul Mellon. This is not a fairy tale. There were many, many years of horror show. Um, which you will find out about in the book. <laughs> Meantime, Oak Spring had grown to include outbuildings and orchards, and they were all in the same low-key farmscape style that you had seen her begin with at Apple Hill. If you stand outside the library, and I hope you all will make a, a point to go there, Make, a, make, an, you know, make an appointment to go and see the library in the gardens. Stand outside the library and look down the hill and you'll see this village. Looks like a village. Well, then you have to ask yourself, 
You know, you have to you have to ask yourself. You can't just be always lulled into complicity. You say, well, who was this village for? It was a feudal village built for two people, Paul and Bunny. So just remember that. By now, the Garden Library, one of the finest in the world, as I said, had also grown exponentially. And she was one of the early people to in making a garden library to include travel and journals and poetry and cartography uh, and many different kinds of science so that the garden library was not just about what any of us might think of as gardens. It incorporated all the ingredients that went into making a garden or landscape. Special favorites of hers were the great 16th and 17th century florilegia, as they were called, uh, such as the one that's on her lap. I mean, if you see a, ha a happy woman, that's a happy woman in that photograph. I take Oak Spring. I mean, there were a lot of gardens, and you might say, well, why aren't you talking about any of the other gardens? Well, we only have half an hour, so why not just dig in and see what it is about style and place that make Oak Spring and her gardens so singular? They're formal, don't wiggle this. Um, they're formal, but they're not symmetrical. They're inclusive of memory. Do you see that slanting line that runs down slightly to the right-hand side of the, uh, the, the plan? That's the line of the old wall of the Fletcher Cabin Garden of the site where they built their house on the footprint that gray footprint is the actual footprint, the center section of it, of the 18th century, early 19th century uh, Fletcher cabin. So she wanted to encode a lot of things in any landscape that she made. The Mary Cup Potter Crab Apple Arcade, off to the right, leads to a small greenhouse where she experimented with topiary trees that became her symbol and which we all now have, but she was, while not the first, she was really the popularizer of what she called herb trees. I shot this picture in the late spring, uh, only months after Bunny's death in 2014. And she said a great thing. It's in one of her four garden catalogs. She wrote, too much should not be explained about a garden. Its greatest reality is not reality, for a garden is always hovering in a state of becoming. It sums up its own past and future. And I think that's one of the great things to think about if you are looking at a vegetable patch or if you're looking at Versailles. It doesn't matter. It sums up its past and its future because the thing keeps growing. Gardens are the slowest of the performing arts. So what do we see here? We see her favorite Kingsville box off at the left grows an inch a year. So when you see a Kingsville box, you know, it's giving you antiquity in its very framework. There's also Tucrium in the foreground, a messy little foot-high hedge to separate it from the bricks and from the paving stones. Some violas, a cranesbill geranium that cascading over onto the paving, a hosta in the middle, Aquilegia canadensis sparking the place with orange in the background, and the gate in the distance. Can you make out that gate? Can you see there's a, there's a walk, there's a, there are, there's a bigger tree, and to the left of it is a wooden gate, simple wooden gate, that opens to the <coughs> crabapple arcade that we saw a picture of earlier in plan. Vegetable squares. So it's a potager. Many of you probably know the potager of Barnsley House uh, in England. And bunnies and, oh, help. Who built Barnsley House? Suzanne, help me. Oh, mm, okay. Famous English woman gardener, lost her name. Somebody will come up with it at some point. Hmm? 
No, later than that. Uh, 1950s. Same period as, as Penelope Hophouse. Okay, keep throwing them out. Don't hesitate to interrupt. So as you look into the middle background on the left-hand side, you'll see a foot-high cordon of apple trees. Think how long and how much time it took to make a foot-high cordon of apple trees. Also, plain bare soil for any good gardener in a vegetable gardener, in a, a vegetable garden or as in a potager is not an embarrassment. It's there, it's waiting to be planted with something. You don't always have to cover everything up. That was another one of Bunny's strictures. It's in the process of becoming, as she wrote. In the small greenhouse at the end of the walk of the Mary Potter crab apples, there are paintings on the walls that also encode the garden in yet another way. Fernand Renault's trompe l'oeil paintings portray all that is needed to garden at Oak Spring and all that it produces as well. Who can pick out Bunny's blue hat? Right, okay, is on the shelf. And in the foreground, there's a birdcage. And for a long time, when I saw this photograph by Peter Coates, a great English photographer, I thought it was part of the painting. But no, it's actually standing in the open space of, of this little greenhouse. And Bunny said to me, she said one time, she said that she, she felt that a birdcage, she had a lot of birdcages, um, was a symbol for her of a life where she felt caged, but she could always get out and she could always return. So I thought, you figured it out, girl. You've got it all laid out. She did it. On the lowest shelf at the right lies her often consulted copy of Noisette's uh, Le Jardin Fruitier, which was her pruning go-to. And there's one of her pair of a lorn white leather gardening glove. So I'll give you a minute just to look at this, and I'd like somebody in the audience to pick out two other things. What do you see? Anybody? Anything? Absolutely, and representing representing the orchards that you saw in an, in an earlier photograph. Yeah, okay, that's, that's the start. Sorry I'm such a teacher, very boring. In the main room of the garden library, the covered doors protect the books from light streaming in. I mean, when you walk into this library, you say, is this really a library? Where are the books? The boards were cut from oak trees on the farm and paled out with a, with a coat of whitewash, which I think people use a lot these days, to, to make a room pale and comfortable. But Bunny Mellon was one of the first to use that, besides 18th century French people in houses in Paris. So she wrote, Bunny wrote, these books about the outdoors live not in dusty darkness. So it's a living room in which to read, to sit, to dream, and to dream about your reading and where it will take you. It's a very comfortable room, and when you visit, you can go there and sit in one of these chairs, and you can't handle the books, I'm sorry to say, but you can walk around and see what it feels like to be in a library that's welcoming in a very different way. The library nestles below Paul's broodmare barn. He was a famous breeder, and, uh, and his horses won all over America and all over Europe as well. That's the gable of the broodmare barn, and it's nestled. the library is nestled between and below that broodmare barn and between the pastures. So in a way, I think of Oak Spring as an American pastoral that she and Paul made together. The library was also a gift from him, and he was a man who was in love with books. Ah, a secret. The enclosed garden at Oak Spring 
runs what I think of as a direct current into Bunny Mellon's mind. When you open the book, the frontispage, 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 the frontis, the frontis, the frontis photograph um, is of Bunny Mellon standing at this window. I stood at this window and took this photograph a, a few months after her death. I'm not a good photographer, but this happened to be quite a good one, I thought. So it was shot from that dressing room window. And I want you to particularly notice the shutters on either side. In every house, in every window, there were three sets of ways to control the light. There were shutters. There were two different kinds of screens. There were, when the house was closed at Oak Spring in, in uh, midsummer, throughout the summer when they were at other houses, and also in January and February, it was black inside. But there were always these ways to control and veil the light. Look at the louvers. Behind one of those shutters, when the place was being surveyed and itemized by Sotheby's for the sale in November 2014, Nancy Collins, who was uh, Bunny's nurse and then her archivist because she was the one who knew everything, so smart to hire her because she knew where every piece of paper was, um, lifted the, the window seat. There were window seats at every window that had these deep louvers, after all. Uh, you had to have space for the three different kinds of shutters, the three, et cetera, et cetera. And when she lifted up the, the, the cushion for the window seat, she accidentally hit the side inside wall of, of the inframing of the window. And then she looked and she saw a tiny little button made of wood the size of my little fingernail. And she pulled it and pulled, out came a secret concealed compartment. The necklace is about this long. It was in a box. It was hidden inside. It tells you the story of flowers and love in 128 colored sapphires. And it tells you the story of a great secret. Now, I'm not saying that Buddy was anything like King Tut, who did away with his carpenters or his stonemasons. But after all, that carpenter was the only other person who knew beside Bunny where that necklace was hidden. And it was, could have stayed there to this day, except for Nancy Collins hearing this little hollow sound. So there it is, the most extrava extravagant of all her jewels. And it's good to remember that bold extravagance because it was something she never felt she had to explain. You know Disraeli's famous quote. Disraeli said, never complain, never explain. And that's not a garden saying, but that's a very useful saying, isn't it? What? <laughs> oh, OK. Oh, really? OK, well, I guess. That's right. That's right. Don't, yes, don't talk in public. Yeah, never, never, never complain about the difficulties of your life. So, or anybody else's life. So the ebullience and the boldness of that fantastic necklace that we've just looked at, let's have another look at it, um, are also revealed in their best known Van Gogh, which is a green wheat fields at Auvers that hung over the mantel in the living room and is now at the National Gallery of Art. To give you an idea of its scale, it's not very big. It's only about this big. But doesn't it absolutely command the screen, the space? It does command, did command the space in the most extraordinary way. After their grand foray of the 50s and 60s into the Impressionists and post-Impressionists, Bunny, in the 1970s, ventured into the Abstract Expressionists, buying more than a dozen Rothkos in a very famous incident you can read about in my book. The Greatest Yellow Expanse, number 21, warmed the east wall of the Garden Library for decades and was sold privately before 
the Sotheby's auction after Bunny's death in 2014. Views like, views like this one of Oak Springs lawn and, and pasture and wood and horizon make it impossible for me to separate Bunny's understanding of landscape from what she understood about art, about what the artist Richard Diebenkorn was up to in works like this one, his Ocean Park, series number 61, where layers of paint and worked edges culminate in a distant horizon, that thin red line, just as they do in the horizons of Oak Spring or of any of her landscapes. It's a matter of seeing. It's a matter of not simply of creating it. It's seeing what's there first and working with it. And I'm sure you all, many of you are gardeners. How many are gardeners in this audience? Oh, great. So you know, you take, it, you take advantage of what's there. You look at what's there. That's what Bunny did. She looked at this. Was somebody being told she wasn't or was a gardener over here? <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, all right, okay. I'm sticking with Van Gogh just the same way I'm sticking with, uh, uh, I could have used uh, many, many other painters, just the same way I'm sticking with Oak Spring to give you the thread a lot of a lot of her thinking and choices. So Van Gogh painted the harvest at the plain at La Croix near Arles in more than, more than a dozen times in dense and vivid color, but Bunny and Paul Mellon bought a late version that is scratched in brown ink with a reed pen over graphite on textured paper. Its focus on pattern reminds me of that corner of the enclosed garden at Oak Spring that we saw. It's the same pointillist and variety a buddy always also said, just for a handy, um, a handy tip, she said, always mix in a big leaf among the smaller foliage, as the hosta does in this one. But it is that pointillist approach to be able to have all of that flowering at once. And that's Ellen Shipman. <laughs> Not that you feared color in the garden. Don't let me say that this is the color of her garden, because it wasn't. But in a 1960s work by the New York surrealist artist, actually, he just smoked a lot of grass, I think, <laughs> by the New York artist Matty Clarwine, shows the bold range included in gardens in Antigua. Oh, I love some. Yeah, thank you. as well as at Oak Spring. Remember, we saw that picture of Bunny and Eliza uh, and Jackie Kennedy in that place where there was a pineapple on the table as a sort of sign of hospitality and the enfoldingness of this kind of color was characteristic of all of her gardens in various parts at various seasons. But it was always anchored by form. Can anybody pick out the Tide Hill boxwood? Lower right corner. The Oak Spring small greenhouse is seen at upper right, and the crabapple arbor is seen in its infancy, and there's one of Bunny's topiary trees. So they're all the symbols, the sort of hagiography of her work. However, she also had a great sense of humor. Don't miss the blown dandelion head down at right. She made him put it in. She grew roses quite sparingly. Those that she carefully selected were often climbers or cutting roses. Um, Henri Fantin Latour's Roses of Nice on a Table is an example. That's also at the National Gallery of Art. I mean, you can't go to the National Gallery and not find at least 30 of their Impressionist paintings on show, many of them as luscious as this. The, uh, the Van Gogh, the wheat fields at Auvers, is always on show. However, shadow clinches a single color effect at Oak Spring, where the Narinis that are known as naked ladies 
climbed the slope to a log cabin above Goose Creek that winds its way through the 4,500 preserved acres of land that Paul Mellon and Bunny accumulated over their long decades together. They're, they're all preserved today. It's the largest single patch of land that you can see from a plain in Virginia. And that's saying something, isn't it? That's a lot. Virginia's big. So Bunny made a list of what she thought were her best works, and the Rose Garden was one. She said that the shadows were the best part of that garden, meaning the shadows of the four corner magnolias. It wasn't the planting plan, it wasn't the layout, it wasn't the trees themselves, it was the shadows and how they crossed the lawns and gave it life just as shadows do lacing this little log cabin above Goose Creek. To conclude, I return to her love of topiary and form. Here she stands in the big industrial sized greenhouse across the road from Oak Spring that provided many of the grown on plants for the pointless look of that corner. I'm not saying this was easy gardening. This is not easy gardening. It takes a lot of work, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, but it's very beautiful to see. And you can work from it too, as you all know, I'm sure. She taught me how to pluck boxwood with nail scissors. You reach in. How many of you know how to pluck a boxwood? Okay, you, well, box grows here. You reach into the plant with your nail scissors and you twist it, or you reach in with your, oops, left hand, and then you twist it a little bit, and then you find from the interior of the plant, not from shearing it outside, because that's very bad for the plant, you find out a place that you can cut a small branch to render the, the volumes of the boxwood very airy so that they don't get mold or get sick, because the wind can blow through them. And I return to her love of simple flowers, like the ones we saw in that corner garden. These are daisies, and they were painted by Van Gogh. That's what I said I was going to stick to. And now that's in the Virginia Museum of Fine Art in Richmond. But I love this painting. I hate, I have, I'm not giving you the inches, but it's only this big. It's tiny. <laughs> it hung above her bathtub um, at Oak Spring, next to that dressing room we saw. And guess what? It was steamed there for decades and no damage at all. I'm not advising that you try it. And lastly, I return to her very own never-ending labor in the garden. Thank you all very much for coming and I welcome, I welcome any questions and also as we circulate having a daiquiri. Can you visit? Can you visit Oak Spring? Yes, you can visit. Library. Oh, library. Yeah. Yes, if you look up Oak Spring Garden Foundation. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, DC. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody has had the chutzpah to ask if they can fly into that airstrip. Oh my goodness. There used to be an airstrip here, you know. Oh, oh, okay. All right, yes. I can give you, a, the, the question is, what happened to the rose garden after Bunny's design? How long did it last? It lasted until it, it needed some work and many people thought that it needed renovation. I did not agree with that and many people, most people who are gardeners did not agree with that in 2010. They're, whether they're in flower or fruit or bare branches, you can see what Bunny means by having the shade, the shadow, the patterns of what's overhead be the most illuminating thing about the garden for her. They made the garden ADA accessible, which was great. They widened the paths, which was great. That central terrace of, of green lawn had become punctured by all the TV apparatus that in, increasingly uh, were placed in, in the rose garden. So in 2010, the trees went, the borders 
the borders were no longer four season borders. They had, this is what I thought was deplorable and ha ha, they've discovered it was a mistake to plant more than 500 roses in an enclosed space in Washington, D.C. in a humid climate. Hello! That didn't work, so they're busy uh, revising the planting plan now. Um, we, I hope, a lot of people hope that the trees will, will return, the, the patterns of shade and shadow will return, and at the same time that it'll be ADA accessible and be a wonderful place for people who are visiting the White House to walk and think. Any more questions? We can always go for have a drink. Oh. Okay. One more question. One more question over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oak Spring Garden Foundation. And it gives you all the stuff that they're doing that's environmentally sound, as well as Bunny Mellon's Gardens, as well as the library, as well as the scholarship program. It's a really, it's really a great website. And, and the money that the $218 million dollars from the sale of her Sotheby's effects, uh, her effects at Sotheby's, all was poured into the Gerard B. Lambert, named after her father, foundation, um, as part of the endowment for the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. So she realized what she wanted most, which was to leave a permanent legacy of her own self. Good for a woman. The house is a perfectly ghastly <sighs> simulacrum of what the place used to be. You don't want to visit it. It's part of the trust, but it's a private headquarters for the foundation staff. And they know my views. Um, no, no, no. It'll, it'll always be, remember the none of the works of art there anymore. And there's none of the porcelain, and there's none of the faded old chintz, and there's none of the kind of... All of it was sold. Yeah, yeah, pretty much all of it. So focus on the gardens and the library, which are all exactly as they were. So thank you, thank you again. So, so a, a huge round of applause for Mac for this talk, but also she talked about, you know, Bunny's gardens being in a state of becoming. We are in a state of becoming, and there is more. Exactly, there is more to come. But another round of applause for helping us be in that state of becoming. It would have happened without you. All right, and yes, please stay for a drink and a little bite. And uh, anyone who has not seen the gardens tonight should definitely take a, a, a peek because they're spectacular. We'll, we'll, we'll go with Mac and see the gardens. Thank you all. Thank you again.